Daniel chapter 2, as we continue, we are going to build on what we had done. May 3rd, we done a message and began this uh, topic. Our Sunday school class this morning, if you were not here, I encourage you to reference it. Uh, it laid some groundwork for what we'll be covering today. Daniel chapter 2, the end of verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas, Daniel, thou, or Nebuchadnezzar, thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, this last kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron was mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces, the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word of God. We are continuing to focus on this last global government, the rise of global government. After the flood, Noah commanded Noah and his son, or God commanded Noah and his sons, their wives, to fill the earth. But man didn't. Instead, within only two generations, there was this first attempt at global government with the intent of rebelling against God. Now again, Yahweh had told them to fill the earth to glorify him. Instead, man sought to consolidate power and to make a name for himself. And of course, the name Nimrod is means to rebel. Well, Lord Acton, famous British politician, once said, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. God has always recognized the sin nature within man. And as such, God has established levels of government to check man's desire to sin. It begins with self-government. Folks, that's one of the fundamental breakdowns of our country today. We used to discipline our children with love. In fact, discipline was a sign of love. We used to teach them absolute truths and right and wrong. And that is the primary area of defense us having the capability of making the right decision. As a matter of fact, that's why in our early days, you had to be a professor of faith in Christ or you could not serve in public office. And the main reason was, is that when you are alone, you recognize that you're not really alone because the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, observing the evil and the good. Discipline, accountability, self-government, quite frankly, you know, when you consider, I was thinking just the other day, as many times as I studied it and taught it and getting ready to teach it again uh, this Wednesday night, so please be back. We are back for Wednesday nights now, so uh, be back here and join us, 6.30 for youth, 6.45 for the adults. But, you know, the law makes sense. Moses went up and down Mount Sinai several times, and the law, capital L, was basically the constitution for this new nation of Israel. And it comprised of three sections. The law, which is God's morality, absolute truth, the Ten Commandments. Folks, those, that's self-government. When Jesus said uh, the law, what's the most significant or most important law? He said, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the Ten Commandments rest on. The first four commandments deal with man's relationship to God. The last six deal with man's relationship to man. But the Ten Commandments are the foundational. That's self-government. Then you've got what are called the statutes. You see civil law laid out in great detail. Then you see the uh, judgments, which is the ceremonial spiritual law of their day, including all uh, that was involved in the temple, uh, temple worship went along with it. But it begins with self-government, your ability to make good decisions based upon what's right and wrong. Now, as a believer, you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit that also gives you that strength. 
I'm sure many of you have a testimony much like mine, where the first 26 years are very interesting. The last 31 years have been very consistent. There was something significant that happened in year 26. That's when I fell on my face, cried out to Jesus, surrendered to him as Savior and Lord, and had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing all those bad habits that characterized those years in college and pro football went away like that because that is God within us giving us the will and the ability to do what he's commanded us to do. But the second level is family government. Quite frankly, that is another area that has been under attack. It's up to the parents to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Then there is church government. It's amazing all the responsibility that was entrusted to the church. In fact, I didn't have a chance, I mentioned it, meant to mention it this morning, but as the Jews were spread throughout uh, the Gentile world and the diaspora, the synagogues were basically self-governing. The Romans didn't care what the Jews did within their own communities, as long as they didn't create a riot or cause problems or break some massive Roman law. So the rabbis had significant authority and power, and they were to govern internally. Folks, that's why Paul rebuked that church in Corinth so severely. They were cheating each other and then dragging each other out into the civil arena, the civil courts. And Paul said, don't you know that you all are going to judge angels one of these days? Can't you all handle this within your realm of church government? Quite frankly, there is supposed to be a realm of authority in the local church. And then the smallest part of all of these hindrances to evil is civil government. Now, as many times as I've studied about the Tower of Babel, I had never really gotten an adequate answer as to why God established the nations. It dawned on me yesterday that I think it may be this. Notice a statement that God said here. Behold, there's just one group of people. Now remember, God said, fill the earth, obey me, raise your children in the nurture and admonition of me, and glorify me. Do it my way. My way always works best. But instead, they unified together and built a tower to glorify themselves. They were going to make a name for themselves. And notice what God said here in verse 6. Behold, the people is one. They will have one language, and this they will begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Let me give you an example of the significance and importance of nations. Back in the 1930s, there was an evil, wicked man that sought to bring Germany to prominence, sought to conquer the world and issue or, or usher in the Third Reich. One of his passions was to destroy, to annihilate the Jewish people. Quite frankly, he was not the Antichrist, but he is a type of the Antichrist. Well, how was he checked? You know what? It took a stronger nation to come along and check the wickedness of that evil nation. Now, keep that in the back of your mind there. We're going to come back to it in a little while. At Babel, Nimrod had led an open rebellion to Yahweh, building this tower, worshiping the host of heaven, and deifying himself. 350 years earlier, God had destroyed the earth because of unrestrained evil that was global. And now again, God observed what was going on, and he reported what I said a moment ago. The people are one. There's a concentration of power. As such, nothing will be strained from them which they have imagined to do. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, a one-world government with no fear of God and no one capable of restraining man's evil intentions. So God forced a pseudo-obedience at Babel. As God divided their concentration of power by confounding their languages, and man did, after that, in fact, fill the earth. But there's something about the division of nations that creates an environment by which every nation must lean on God, must obey God, to be blessed by God, and then to glorify God. As power is concentrated, Man is drawn to glorifying himself. Right. Do not forget that point. We'll come back to that. Right. It's interesting that during this time in human history, 
The Bible says these things. For example, Paul, while preaching to the Athenians, said this, that God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. And God has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Who's the they? Those nations. It was God's will to divide into nations. Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Folks, that is an explanation for why we have been, in fact, so unique. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Psalm 9, 17 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget about God. So during this age, God likes the idea. In fact, it was he who established sovereign nations. What about during the millennial reign? You know, folks, Isaiah talks about there being a period of time where there will, in fact, be peace on earth. Well, mankind will beat their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, where the seed of David will literally rule and reign from the throne of his father, David. A righteous government. The Jews call it the age of the Messiah. We call it the millennial reign of Christ. But during that period of time where there is perfect government. We see that Psalm 72 identifies that there are still nations around the planet. Psalm 72, 17 reaffirms that nations shall call him blessed. Isaiah 2 says this, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house, by the way, that mountain is a prophetical term for nation. Well, I think I reference that later on. Shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge, who's the he? Jesus shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Folks, peace on earth. But it's interesting to note that even during this period of time, God still has separate sovereign nations. In fact, what's remarkable, and honestly, I can't explain this to you, but after the establishment of the new heavens, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem, Revelation 21, 24 says this, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Amen. Folks, man is no doubt of one race. We are created in the image of God. However, God is glorified among the nations. And man glorifies himself through the concentration of power in tyranny. Right. Ever since Nimrod, man has filled the earth. But there has been a constant battle going on with aspiring men intent on ruling the earth. Remember this, man doesn't generally, listen to this, man doesn't generally set out to do evil. But men do what is right in their own eyes. As you think about that, consider when Satan tempted Eve. Satan didn't go up to Eve and say, Eve, I want you to disobey God. I want you to be in defiance to God Almighty. He said, hey, Eve, what's going on? Did God really say that you weren't supposed to eat that tree? First thing Satan does is gets you to question what's right and wrong, question what God has said. And then notice how he made this a good thing. He said, Eve, it's not really that bad. If you eat of the fruit, your eyes are going to be open. As a matter of fact, you'll be just like God's, knowing good and evil. Eve, this is not bad. This is a good thing. But Samuel said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The point is this. Men take their eyes off of God and decide to do what they think is right. Hey, I think contact tracing on your iPhones is a good idea. That way we'll be able to monitor COVID-19, people that have come into contact with COVID-19. Hey, I think drones are a good idea for public safety. We'll be able to tell if you're not keeping proper social distancing. 
Hey, we believe that sustainable development is good for planet Earth. We need to have a targeted population. We need to have certain population centers and certain rules and requirements. Oh, these are good. Global tracking, it's for your good. Global identification and a health ID. Folks, I'm not kidding. One of the most recent calls I was on, they are actually talking about licensing churches in some of these Democrat-run cities. Democrat-run cities before they are going to let them meet again. Wow. Now, folks, the government has no say-so over the church. No. They have no say-so in doctrine or what we do unless we do something stupid like sacrifice chickens. <laughs> then they can step in. But as far as us meeting together and preaching and teaching, they cannot tell us when or how many. That's right. But they are legitimately talking about licensing churches before they are allowed to gather again because of the COVID-19 scare. I beg your pardon, I don't trust anyone in government, especially someone led by a letter D in front of their name. Cashless society, controlling speech, global education, global health care. Hey, let me tell you, the David Rockefellers, the Bill Gates, the George Soroses, the Karl Marxes, the Saul Alinskys, the Nancy Pelosi's, the Bernie Sanders, the Barack Obamas, and the Joe Bidens, say these are good things for you people. We're going to take care of you. This is a good thing, folks. It never ends well. Now, we love to look at the map and see America being right in the middle of the world, and that's the way we've always looked at it. However, when God looks at the map, Jerusalem, the nation of Israel, is the center of how God sees it. I'm often asked if America is anywhere in Bible prophecy. Well, actually, yes. Joel chapter 3, Zechariah chapter 14, Rome, uh, Revelation chapter 19. Three different places where it says all the nations of the world are going to come together against Jerusalem at the Battle of Armageddon. Folks, we won't be here. The rapture will have taken place. But I hope, I, I gotta tell you, I never thought I'd see America in the condition we are in now while we are still here. I always understood, yeah, America could just goose step right into uh, global totalitarianism once you take the body of Christ now, no longer have any Christian politicians or Christian generals or, or, or churches or anything like that. All you've got is lost people. America's gonna look just like every other pagan culture that ever lived in world history. But by golly, we're sitting here, we're supposed to be salt and light, and we're looking pretty dark and tasteless right now in the United States of America. But we will be a part of that last global effort to stamp out every Jew on the planet. We'll not preach about the why on that this morning. This will be right before Christ returns. This will be at Armageddon. This will be when Zechariah 14, it looks like the devil will finally have won. The scripture says that half the city of Jerusalem will be taken. The houses rifled and the women ravished. And just as it looks like it's all over, they will cry out for the Messiah. The Jews will cry out for the Messiah. And guess who shows up? First time he came, Zechariah 9, 9, humbly bringing salvation, riding on a donkey's colt over the Mount of Olives. The next time he comes back, it's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and there will be hell to pay. Amen. But as we saw in Sunday school this morning and in past weeks, God will again focus on Israel once the bride of Christ is removed. And Daniel 9 talks about this in great detail. Revelation chapter 6 through 19 expands on that. There are still seven years of judgment to be poured out on planet Earth, which will bring to a conclusion all of what we call Bible prophecy. It will fulfill all of God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David. And during these final seven years, Daniel tells us of this last last global empire ruled by ten Malek kings. This is the last of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Let's just review that real quickly to remember. Remember, the next thing on the Jewish timeline, they are looking 
for this king, the Messiah. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Uh, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David, by the way, the angel Gabriel reiterated that to Mary in Luke chapter 1. Where was David's throne? Thank you. And upon his kingdom. What was David's kingdom? Boy, that's weak. Wow. Next time I'll tell you all to study for the pop quiz. I honestly didn't realize those two questions were that hard. Let's try it once more. Where was David's throne? I'm glad you went to first grade Sunday school. What kingdom did David rule over? Doc, would you dismiss us? I'm going to go back. Okay. With just judgment from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Again, Daniel is expecting that in 70 years. Then in Daniel chapter 9, it's revealed that that is much longer. But in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar received that dream. And in order to check out his counselors, the counselors that he had inherited from his father. Boy, don't you wish President Trump had done that. Don't you wish he'd have gone through and cleaned house with his counselors on day one? See, Nebuchadnezzar was new. Nebuchadnezzar had been the king. Nebuchadnezzar had been the number one general for his papa. All of a sudden, he's now in charge. He had this dream. He said, I don't know what in the world that means. I'm going to call dad's wise men. Hey, wise men, I need you to interpret a dream for me. You are my magi. You're my magistrates. I need some counsel from you. They said, we'll be happy to, Your Honor. In fact, we're in town. We're not working at the carnival this next week. We can be gladly be here to, to read your poems and tell your fortune. Tell us your dream. We'll make something up and tell you what it means. He said, no, I've seen your act before. Here's how I'll know you can tell me what it means. First, you tell me what it was. I said, oh, I can't do that. One would have to be able to commune with the gods. Oh, wait a second. We're supposed to be able to commune with the gods. Nebuchadnezzar had a great retirement program. He says, I'm going to kill you and turn your house into a dunghill. <laughs> Boy, that's motivation. As the security team was working through the city of Babylon, knocked on Daniel's door, and Daniel said, wait a second. I'm not guilty of this. Let me have a chance. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prayed. God revealed to them the vision and what it meant. This image that he had had, the times of the Gentiles, first with a head of gold, which is identified, Daniel 2.38, Nebuchadnezzar, that's Babylon. It's going to be followed by the body of silver, the chest and arms. Daniel 8.20 tells us that that's Media Persia, followed by Greece. Daniel 8.21 tells us that's Greece. Why are these so significant? Because these were involved, revolved around Jerusalem, revolved around Israel. This is the times of the Gentiles. The Jewish king had been taken into captivity because Israel had been in dis disobedience and apostasy. So Jerusalem and Israel was subject to Gentile rule until the times of the Gentiles be complete. Then it talks about this fourth kingdom, the legs of iron in Rome. John tells us, Revelation 17 10, that that is Rome. Then we have this period. Why is this period here not seen in the Old Testament? We've reviewed this before. In fact, we did it in Sunday school this morning. Because the church age is not visible in the Old Testament. Read Ephesians 3. Read Jesus' discourse on the mystery parables. Now, it says that in the last days, there would be a last world empire that's comprised of these ten kings. And as I read this morning, it said, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. In other words, not from Babylon to, to, to Media Persia, to Greece, to Rome. This time, it's King Jesus, and it's going to be King Jesus from that point on and forever. Okay? So, it is this group here that we are looking at today that will be in power. Now, here's one thing I want you to note. Was Babylon a literal kingdom? Yes. Was uh, Media Persia a literal world kingdom? Yes. Actually occupied terra firma in this three-dimensional world in which we exist. Yeah. Was uh, Greece a literal kingdom? Yes. Was Rome a literal kingdom? Yes. Do you think that the ten kings would be a literal kingdom? Yes. And do you think that the kingdom of heaven on earth 
would actually be a literal kingdom on earth? If this is consistent in your interpretation, then I would have to say that the answer is yes. By the way, all of these had a sinful desire to rule the world. And there's going to be one that's actually qualified and righteous and will rule the world. But in the days of these ten kings, the Messiah is going to come and establish his eternal kingdom. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 9, Revelation 12, Revelation 17. What do we know about these kings? Well, Revelation 17 tells us about a beast with seven heads and ten horns. This beast represents the world political powers under Satan's control. Guess who has got control of global politics right now? Satan does. Does that mean that we can't have Christians in office that do good things? No, we have often had Christians in office that do good things. But remember when Jesus was being tested by Lucifer himself. Lucifer said, if you fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Well, guess what? You read, oh, good grief. You know, I just go from one thing to the other. I, we're going to take three hours today. In fact, no. You read Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, and you'll see all this is talked about. You'll see the, the seven-sealed scroll held by the Ancient of Days that we see in, Dan, in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 is actually the fulfillment of the prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Okay, so this kingdom, there will be one who actually rules and reigns in righteousness. But we see this prophecy beginning in Revelation chapter 17, verse 9, talking about the global powers now under Satan's control. He said, here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. Now again, in Bible prophecy, a mountain is a nation. Look at Daniel chapter 2. It's an image of a great mountain to fill the whole earth. What was that? That was the kingdom of heaven on earth. Isaiah 2, 2. In the last days, that mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. The top of this mountain shall he be exalted above all the hills, and nations shall flow into it. So a mountain is a picture of a nation. Verse chapter 10 adds that there are seven kings. King and kingdom are often synonymous. As Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, you are that head of gold. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was the emperor of Babylon and the Babylonian Empire. Okay, so we've got these seven kings or kingdoms. Which seven kingdoms are these? Remember, Israel is God's chosen nation. And Jerusalem was the capital city. With that consideration, this would refer to Gentile powers that affected Israel. Israel was, in effect, born when Jacob and the 70 family members moved into Egypt during the time of Joseph. So we begin with Egypt, followed by Assyria, followed by Babylon, followed by Media Persia, followed by Greece, followed by Rome. Remember, the Messiah came and Zechariah 9.9 was rejected, but there was no justification for Israel to reject her promised king, just wickedness and disobedience. So we see this period of the church age. Right now, Paul talked about the mystery of the church in the book of Ephesians. Both Jew and Gentile, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then the church will be taken out. That last seven years will be dealt with during the seventh king, which is this period of ten kings. Ten kings. Revelation goes on and says, Five are fallen, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece. One is, as John is writing, that being Rome, and one is yet to come, that being this last age of global government. Now again, you remember, talked about this for the first time. Don't have time to go back and repeat everything. If you want to find it, go back to our sermon we did on May 3rd, where we began this journey. And I pointed out that week that the word used here is Malek, king, not Mamlaka, kingdom. There's a difference. Sometimes the words are interchangeable, but I personally think this is intentional in Daniel chapter 2. We've had people try to, try to describe, hey, it's 10 regions or 10 countries, whatever. I personally think that these are 10 individuals attempting to rule the world. 10 Rothschilds or Rockefellers or Gates or Soros that will come together for power. Hey, why should that surprise us? Man has always tried to rule the world. Now, we're first introduced to these kings in Daniel chapter 2. We learn more in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8 says, I considered the horns. 
And there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns uprooted. And behold, in this horn there were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So we see an eleventh horn or king here, who was initially called the little horn. He was lesser to the ten. He has eyes and a mouth. He's the front man for the ten. He is their spokesperson. Verse 20 says that he'll become great, after speaking great pompous words, and instead of being the lesser horn serving the ten, he becomes Rav, more stout. The Hebrew word that means captain or lord or master over. You all are familiar with the term rabbi. Rab, master, lord, teacher. I, my, my teacher. Okay, Rab, he becomes the leader of the ten. Now apparently, this rise to power was not without resistance, as verse 8 and verse 24 identify three of the original ten kings that will be plucked up by their roots and subdued. Any of you that are students of World War II or history remember the assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler. I personally believe that there will be an assassination attempt on Mr. Big Shot. You've got the group of ten behind the scenes that are trying to orchestrate control over the world. Man wants to do what's right in his eyes. Oh, trust me with the power. Oh, I'm, I, you can trust me to have absolute control over, over everything. And the ten put forward this front man. Don't think of him as coming out as an evil, wicked man. Think of him as a perfect politician. That's everything to everybody. And really stands for nothing. Scripture says that he's going to attack the very existence of God and the law of God. And he will seek to destroy the saints of the Most High. Now, by the way, as Daniel is writing that, how would you define saints of the Most High? Would you define that? No. As Daniel is writing that, who would you call saints? Jews. That's right. Seven years, that seven-year period, you might want to be here. I won't be. Feel free to hang around if you like. I plan to be gone during that period of time. And as you read Daniel and Revelation specifically, there is a final seven-year period within which God will finish his punishment and the purification of Israel. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, the 70 years was multiplied times seven and it was determined upon, remember, gavel being hit, 70 weeks are determined upon who, Daniel? Who's Daniel's people? And upon thy holy city. To wrap it all up, anoint the Messiah in the most holy place, and according to Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, and establish God's kingdom uh, here on the earth. Now, during this seven-year period of time, it says that these ten will be given a brief period in which they have power. I personally see two wars left. By the way, I'm going to finish this. I've got more to do, but we're going to finish this in 11 minutes, so I'm just going to crash land right now. I see two wars left, biblically. I see it in Ezekiel 38 and 39, what we call the Battle of Gog and Magog. What's interesting about that is it's very specified combatants. It says they're going to come together. Five-sixths of this invading force is going to be destroyed miraculously on the hills of Israel. But it says that Jesus it does show up on the Mount of Olives in this battle. In fact, it says that the Jews will burn the weapons for seven years after this concludes. And says it'll take some, what, six or seven months to clean up the land. And they'll have to bring in crews in order to do so. And it says that, that uh, after that period of time, there will be a call for peace. I think of World War I. After World War I, we had the advent of the League of Nations. After World War II, we had the advent of the United Nations. I see a coming battle and that it concludes there will be a call for peace. And there will be the super politician that's going to bring it in. Of course, he's not going to be the lone man. There's going to be a group that's behind him that's really his power. 
I see the first call, peace, peace. I see disarmament, folks. Every time you see a socialist dictator go into power, it, it is without exception. First thing they want to do is disarm the people for your own safety. Oh, aren't these shootings terrible? Oh, oh, it's just, you know, we just need, all we need is the law enforcement with guns and we just need to disarm everybody. And then the very next thing they do is they take out everybody that is in opposition to them. You look at, 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 at Russia, you look at China, you look at uh, Germany, you look at uh, Cuba, you look at Cambodia, any and every totalitarian. I personally see that in Revelation 6. I see this super politician coming to power, promising peace. I see then war and death. Then you see hyperinflation. See, I'll work a day. One day's work for one day's worth of food and a little shelter over your head. Folks, that's not a free market. That's what you call slavery. If you work one day today, we'll give you enough scraps to get by. And then you see that fourth horseman, what we call the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you see death. 25% of the world's population will die according to what it says in Revelation chapter 6. After that, you see this vision in heaven where John looks and sees the souls of martyred saints beneath the throne, or beneath the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the throne crying out, how long, O oh Lord, are you going to put up with this? Vengeance! Lord says, not yet. But you see the lion of the tribe of Judah beginning to awake and shake in his mane as you see earthquakes, volcanoes, and natural disasters take place on planet Earth. And you see the kings of the earth trying to hide themselves from the face of the wrath of the Lamb of God. The book of Revelation details seven seals, details seven trumpets, details seven plagues. Like childbirth, over the course of seven years, each gets worse in intensity and more frequent in occurrence. Initially, natural expla explainable disasters like earthquakes. By the time you get to the end, folks, there's no explanation if you're a literalist, which I am. Say, Pastor, what do you mean by a literalist? Well, I literally believe that God divided the Red Sea and the Jews walked through it on dry land. I really am sucker enough to believe that. And I really believe that God turned the Nile River into blood. Man. And I don't think it just had a red hue or red tan or whatever. I think it was blood. And I really believe that three days and three nights after Jesus went into the tomb, the stone was rolled away and he had risen from the dead. Man. I am that crazy as a literalist. I really believe that stuff. And in Revelation, it talks about not only natural events, it talks about supernatural events. Well, it talks about intense heat. It talks about intense darkness. It says that every nation, every sea on the planet will be turned into blood. And the rivers turned into blood. Now, folks, we, can, we may be able to survive maybe 40 days without food, but no man can survive more than a couple of days without water. I believe that when that wrath is poured out, it's going to be right at the very end. But in the middle of this thing, it's divided into two parts. Three and a half years at the midpoint talks about a war in heaven. It says that Satan is tossed out for the last time. The Bible also talks about Revelation chapter 13, one of these heads receiving a wound with a sword unto death. I personally lean to the idea that this super politician, Mr. Mr. Big Pants, Mr. Too Big for His Britches, initially the front man, front man for the for the, I'm just saying, the George Soros, Rockefeller, Gates type of group. The 10 Malek kings. He's the front man doing their bidding. But he gets more and more power. He thinks more of himself and then he becomes the boss. They don't like it. Try a rebel, assassination attempt. Doesn't work. Three of them are done away with. And at that point, the Antichrist will be indwelt by Satan himself. And for the last three and a half years, things will increase. In fact, that is one of the most documented times anywhere in the Bible. Through Daniel, through Revelation, it says 42 months, 
42 months. It says 1260 days. It says a time, by the way, a Jewish time is a year from Passover to Passover. A time, times, and the dividing of a time, three and a half years. Time and again talks about this last three and a half years, including what we've covered today, this last three and a half years. Things will continue to get so bad and continue to be so bad. And it talks about the earth dwellers continuing to curse God. There will be some that become followers because the gospel will be preached by 144,000 apostle Pauls and two crazy witnesses that are going to be preaching in the temple court. I wish I had their power. It says when adversaries showed up with them, they could just call down fire from heaven and take care of them. Come in handy at times. <laughs> but even at the end of this, there will be a demonic invasion. Talks about these creatures that can be described as nothing else but demonic. People try to describe them as military instruments. Things I do not. I think it's demons out of, out of the heart of the earth. I think it's those demons that are held there right now that were guilty of, of the, the vileness that took place leading up to the, the flood. And this demonic invasion will draw the nations of the world together against Jerusalem. One last hope that Satan has to win. Hosea 5 seems to indicate that the Lord will not return for Israel until they cry out, Blessed be the name of the Lord. In fact, Jesus even said that, you'll not see me again when he left just before he gave the Olivet Discourse. He says, you'll not see me again until you cry out, blessed be the name of the Lord. I think Satan still thinks he can win if he wipes out the Jews entirely. If the nation of Israel only served the purpose of birthing the Messiah, I don't know why Satan hates them so much still. I mean, time and time and time and time again trying to wipe them out, including, you know, in, in Nazi Germany. And look at the world right now. Why does the world hate Israel? I mean, out of the entirety of the Middle East, they have a little bitty sliver of land. Everything around is Muslim, but they hate Israel. Now, folks, if I am right, if I am right, if I'm wrong, then the world's just going to get better and better and better <laughs> until the Messiah returns. If I'm right, the world is going to become more perilous. There will be a day when there is actually a literal nation of Israel again. In case you hadn't noticed, that's already happened. Jerusalem will be the center of controversy over which the world argues. And they will attempt to divide the land. And the last most significant thing I can see is the development of the call for global government. When I've seen what we've done over the last couple of weeks, I recognize that God was right when He calls us sheep. We are incapable of thinking. We just panic and run in a certain direction. He can just stampede us in any direction. And I'm amazed at how quickly we will give up our unalienable rights for the hope of safety. I mean, I really have been stunned at how quickly the church has folded over the last couple of months. I mean, we even fell for it to some degree, but we were trying to honor our governor and our president, and just in case, you know, we wanted to, we wanted, we supported them both, we wanted to honor them. I was kind of suspicious of the intensity of this whole thing. I thought, I really thought it was overblown, and it's shown to be. But what do we see? Former Prime Minister of England, The Guardian, calling for global government to tackle the coronavirus. We got Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, wanting to have global, trying to have seven, what is it, billion vaccines. Now, folks, have I missed something? It is, isn't the COVID crisis past us? I thought it was past, I mean, we're rioting in the streets now, and there's no social distancing for that, everything seems to be okay. It's amazing how quickly that went from being a front page story to not being a story at all. And it seemed to all happen coincidentally right after uh, Senator Biden made the statement that if you can't figure out you're supposed to vote for me, then you're not really black. That wasn't received well. He was getting some bad press. And the next thing you know, there's a new news story. In fact, that wasn't reported at all hardly in the news. 
But why is there a need for seven million vaccines when I thought it was over? You know, even Fauci said he's not expecting a second wave. And we're in Oklahoma, we never saw the first wave. Even Fauci made the statement a week ago that now if you wear a mask, it's basic. Now, not for everybody, because we have some people that are, that are elderly and have their immune systems down. You know what, folks? When I was at MD Anderson all those weeks of my treatment, there were always some people that wore masks. You know who it was? Those people that had deficient immune systems. That's smart. If your immune system's down and you're susceptible, I'd wear a mask. I'd wear it whether there was COVID-19 or not. I wouldn't want to catch the flu. I wouldn't want to catch the cold. I wouldn't want to catch anything. They, in fact, before COVID-19 was ever heard of, those people were wearing masks at MD Anderson. Why? Because their immune system was down. But Fauci made the statement a, 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 two weeks ago that, that it's, if you're wearing a mask now, it's largely symbolic. So why is there a need for 7 million vaccines? Of course, oh yeah, control is one. Also, it's a whole lot of money. Think of the guy that owns the patent on those vaccines. Seven million doses. Those aren't free, baby. And then what's that? What, I just grabbed a couple of these. By the way, there's, there's an endless supply of them. Oh, Gates and Fauci. Uh, let's see. If they had their way, you'd need an immunity card to move about freely. Yeah, have you heard about that? That's that, social, that tracing deal. We want, to have, we want to be able to track where you're going. Folks, all this is eerily similar. Oh, by the way, unless you have your card, you cannot come into this place of business or go into that place of business or enter here or do that or buy or sell at this grocery store. Boy, that sounds interesting too, does it not? It's preparing humans. It's not there yet. Let me tell you, the mark of the beast, nobody will take the mark. By the way, we won't be here. The bride of Christ will not receive the wrath of the Lamb unless Jesus is a wife beater. But this will be poured out, but, but they're preparing, and, and no one will see them. The mark of the beast is a sign of identification. It's a sign of ownership. It is a pledge of allegiance. Nobody will just accidentally take it. But notice the preparation of the mind. In fact, if you read about this, not only the cards are inconvenient, so they're figuring out ways where we can have it on an app or you can carry it on your phone. They're even discussing a, a permanent dye not visible unless it's under ultraviolet light. Great job preparing. But folks, can you see the signs of the times? Say, Pastor, are you just looking to escape? Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> but, uh, but here's the deal. Here's what this should do. This should motivate us. Should motivate us to action. One, we're supposed to occupy until the Lord comes. We've got to be busy about His business. We've got to be fighting this evil. God likes nations. He doesn't like global government. Man always, you know, concentration of power always ends up badly. Ephesians 5.11 says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, you Christians. In fact, I want you to stand against it. So as long as I have breath in my lungs, I am going to stand against sin and evil and wickedness. And I hope and pray. By the way, there's a man that knows persecution. You want to you find yourself, by the way, I spent the last eight days uh, forbid from being on Facebook. But it was for my well-being because they were afraid somebody would hijack my account because there were these posts going out giving the actual statistics of people that have died because of the COVID-19. I mean, all I was doing is quoting the CDC and facts, but apparently that was dangerous to do. So I was, stop it. Man in the back. He's constantly, Stephen Black. Folks, if you speak out against the LGBT, now here's a man that used to be a homosexual. He was not born that way, but the lust of the flesh drew him into what the Bible calls a great sin. But about 35 years ago, how many years ago was it? 38 years ago, longer than I've been alive. Stephen was born again and saved out of that lifestyle. Now been married for how long? 34 years. You know what? That's a great, that's a, what's that? To a woman, yeah. 
My mind still, that goes without saying, Stephen. But folks, that's a story that shouldn't be trumpeted. But you know who's, one of, who's probably the only man in this room that's more hated than I am? It's him. Laura, maybe. Or where, where is she? I saw her earlier. I know she's here somewhere. Oh, there she is. She is. I promise you. There's this cup. What's that? Charlie. Char oh, yeah. We didn't know. Well, we don't like Charlie. But. <laughs> but you want to talk about suppression of speech? You want to talk about hatred? Boy, it's out there. Folks, these are exciting days. You know, there had to be that terminal generation. There had to be that generation of Christians that was alive, that was at work on the front lines when all of a sudden in the midst of the battle, the trumpet sounds and we're called home. Now that doesn't mean that we're supposed to stop living. Quite the contrary. We're supposed to live life to the glory of God. Get married, have children, raise your families, work hard, go to college, plan a career, serve the Lord day by day, glorify God, occupy until He comes. But the reality is, folks, this should let us know when you see everything that's going on, it's getting late. You know what? In the game of football, if we were behind seven points and looked up at the clock and it was still the first quarter, I wasn't worried. If we were down three points and it was halftime, I wasn't worried. If we were down three points, there was a minute to go in the game, there was a little more sense of urgency, if you know what I mean. We ought to feel a sense of urgency. Whether that means the rapture is coming tonight or the rapture comes in 10 years or 20 years, I believe when you see things working, you see all this stuff, I don't believe is actually. I said this on May 3rd. I find it ironic that every American president we have had since, since Eisenhower, I take that back, I think Kennedy was probably a pretty good president. I wouldn't have voted for him because I was a Republican, but I think he was taken out because he didn't play the game. I think he's pretty good in a lot of ways. But you got every one of these other presidents, from George H.W. Bush, who I voted for being a Republican, and he was a loser, but he was a less of a loser than the guy he was running against. But, uh, but he called for, uh, what, a New World Order. Then you had Bill Clinton, huge proponents of the New World Order. Then you had W, again, daddy's son. Good guy, good old boy, liked him in a lot of ways, but New World Order, globalist. Then you had Barack Obama. Folks, his dad was a communist. That's not a rumor. His dad was a card-carrying communist. His mentor, Frank Marshall Davis, was a communist. I, 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 I don't dislike the guy. I don't like his politics. I'm a free market um, capitalist. I believe in freedom. His upbringing is not that way. But he really advanced. In fact, did a, apologize for how terrible America is. And don't you know, all America is is we've stolen everything that we have, and it's not really ours, and it's just, you know, we're... But all of a sudden, in the midst of all this, call for integrating America into globalism. 2016, we had a goofball run for president. I was a Ted Cruz guy. I thought, who in the world? He will never get elected. I wouldn't vote for Trump if he's the only one on the map. And then I started looking at what he stood for. It's like, oh, I like that. I like free. I like that. And you know what? He gets into office. He has done more for us. He spoke at the March for Life. Not one president is there. He has been the most pro-life president we have ever had. Amen. We have got a... Uh, the Republican-controlled Congress would not repeal the Johnson Amendment. So he issued an executive order, said, hey, you pastors, you're not going to be uh, harassed while I'm president. Boy, that's good. Of course, I did it. I did it anyway. But it sure is nice to know that they're not going to come after me, at least for another six months. You know, every president has said, we ought to have our embassy in Jerusalem. And then once they're elected, for some reason, that's too hard to do. President Trump just said, why is this hard? Here, here's a, move it. <laughs> wow, that was easy. And I got to tell you, you know what? Economics doesn't see skin color. Economics sees effort and hard work. 
And you know what? If you don't have a, if you, if you finish high school, you, you stay married, and you don't have a child before you get married, and you get a job, you got a pretty good chance of turning out well in life. But if you go through multiple divorces, you start punching out kids when you're 15, and you don't finish high school, chances are you're not going to do very well in life. And guess what? It's nobody's fault but yours. Our timer stopped a long time ago. I want you to know it doesn't work for me. I don't think it was a coincidence that in the midst of this economic boom, when our stock market was all-time high, unemployment at all-time low, because the policies of this president actually worked. He's not a central planner to where the government has to control everything. Now, he's still not perfect. There are things he can do better, a lot of things he can do better, but the freedom allows people to prosper. And when we prosper, we all prosper. How many of you like having chocolate candy? You know, 100 years ago, only the rich people had chocolate candy. We couldn't afford it. Now it's made available. How many of you like flat screen televisions? Yeah, it's pretty handy. You gotta probably have 11 of them at your house. I've got two of them in a the closet, for crying out loud. Well, you know, when those things first came out, they were like $10,000. Now you can buy like a 70 inch flat screen television for like 600 bucks. You know why? That's the free market. You got people trying to improve their lives, providing a service to improve your life, better quality product at a lower price, and we all prosper. In the midst of Mr. Make America Great Again, all of a sudden we have what we're at, and our response has been what it is. Folks, don't be surprised. This is just a sign of the times. Do right. The Bible says, don't grow weary in well-doing. Every day, do the right thing. Honor the Lord. Serve the Lord. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's where it begins, right there. You know what? We're going to end with that. And sorry, we have just been, boy, it's fun. I like church. But do you, see, do, do you see things happening? And I'm not cherry-picking. I'm not headlining. I'm not, but I'm saying, wow, sure is interesting. Not going to change my life dramatically. I'm going to serve the Lord faithfully to the best of my ability. I'm going to be the best husband I can be, the best, best father I can be. See my kid get, my youngest kid get married in two weeks. Try to continue to make a living, pay my bills. I'm trying to glorify God. You know, I'm going to try to see people saved. And I'm going to stand against socialism and, and, and atheism. So I'm, that's, all, that's my strategy. And when the Lord comes, He comes. If, he doesn't come, if I die first, then I die first. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. But folks, I just wanted us to see what's going on. Stuff that is going on should get your attention, should get our attention. And the next time the next crisis happens, God willing, we won't be caught flat-footed. And hopefully we'll have an, an influence on the larger body of Christ where the body of Christ won't be caught flat-footed.